bringing you the latest in tax credit news, insight, and analysis. This is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratz. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the November 19th, 2024 podcast. As those of you watching on YouTube can see, I'm here today with my partner, Tony Caponi. And this is another installment in our Renewable Energy Tax Credit Finance Series. Our topic today is very timely. As renewable energy companies prepare to close out their financial reporting for 2024 and get ready for 2025. Now, some of you may recall that Tony and I did a podcast episode on nearing closings last October. In that podcast, we talked about tax and financial reporting, as well as tips for post-commencement operations. And when I say last October, I don't mean last month. I mean a year ago, <laughs> last October. Now, if you haven't listened to that episode, I encourage you to do so. I will include a link to that episode in today's show notes which you can find at www.novaco.com slash podcast. Now, today's episode is going to complement last year's episode. Today, we're going to do, do a deeper dive into the audit process. We're going to discuss the importance of reviewing how the prior year audit went, as well as the lessons that can be learned from that audit. And then we're going to review some of the common mistakes or items easily overlooked by renewable energy clients. You know, I encourage you to listen to the complete podcast so you can avoid uh, some of the common mistakes and avoid overlooking some of the kind of common items. I'd also encourage you to share this podcast with all those in your accounting team. It's a good refresher of items that they should be focused on. We have a lot to discuss today. If you're ready, let's get started. Tony, welcome back to Tax Credit Tuesday. It was, Thanks, Mike. It was really great to see you. It was, uh, I think, two weeks ago about uh, at the Novogratz 2024 Renewable Energy Fall Conference, Renewable Energy Tax Credits Fall Conference, uh, which, uh, as you know, but many of, our, many of our audience don't know, you chaired it. Uh, it was exciting. We had over 600 attendees. You should be proud of the level of attendance at the conference. And it was right after the election. Uh, it was definitely bullish of us to schedule a conference to start on Thursday with the elections just uh, two days earlier. Not only that, the day after the election, and uh, we had over 200 people signing up for the pre-conference project finance primer or primer workshop, depending upon how you like to emphasize the, uh, or how you like to pronounce the I in primer or primer. Uh, that we hosted the day before the conference. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That's right. That, that that event was a fantastic conference. We had, like you said, we had record turnout. Uh, I'd always like to give a big shout out to our co-host, sponsors, speakers, and attendees for helping make that such a great event. But yeah, we had it. We had it right after the election, but which seemed bullish heading into it. But I'll tell you, attendees really appreciated the timeliness of that conference. You know, the election results came out. The industry is wondering what that means for the renewable energy industry. You did your Washington report panel with, with Keith Martin and the folks from SIA and ACP. And I know I got a lot of feedback after that panel where people just felt so relieved to have a better understanding of how the election results sort of helped shape sort of tax policy and the overall industry. So even though it was very bullish going into it, 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 everybody that attended was so appreciative of being there and be able to get that perspective so quick right after the election. So that was huge. Yeah, it was great. I love that conference. We've been doing it that way for many years. We'll probably continue doing it that same way. Um, and we're, we're already planning our next event. We've got the, our spring renewable energy conference is going to be in Chicago in the middle of May. And so you can find the specific dates and registration information on our website. So we're looking forward to that. And for those of you who are really interested in how the election results shape uh, policy, I know you just, you, you're doing, you, you've got your podcast that you did on the election results yes. impacting all the tax credit industries. I think you just did with, with Peter Lawrence. I'm looking forward to tuning into that. And I think everybody else should as well. Yeah, I definitely encourage everyone to listen to the podcast the last week where Peter was a guest and we discussed the implications of the election results in a variety of community development, renewable energy, clean energy tax incentive spaces. 
And we also, you know, have a webinar and the webinar is also today. So it's on the Biver 19th. So if you've downloaded this podcast, the webinar has already been held, but it is something you can go back and review and watch sort of after the fact. So I encourage you to consider signing up for the webinar and reviewing it after the fact as well. Great. So Tony, uh, I mentioned obviously the Renewable Energy Conference uh, and your participation in it and our audience knows that you're a frequent guest on Tax Credit Tuesday as part of this uh, Renewable Energy Finance Series. You also write a lot for the No Regret Journal of Tax Credits. You also speak a lot at other renewable energy industry events. All of that is pretty much a full-time job, but you also, but that's not your full-time job. You know, that's your, that's your side job or your side hustle. I know that many of the listeners and viewers have met you or are familiar with your work already, but that said, I always like it when you say briefly uh, some of the work that you do for Novograd Renewable Energy clients. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely fortunate to be involved in a lot of meaningful aspects of the renewable energy industry, the broader tax credit community overall as well. You know, I still work in other tax credit areas, but in terms of renewable energy or my overall services here at the firm, I am fortunate to be able to oversee three main, three silos of services. That first silo involves what I call transaction advisory services, things like tax equity financial modeling or cost segregation studies and due diligence related services for things like helping clients document compliance with prevailing wage and apprenticeship criteria, those types of services. The second silo of services deals with financial statement audits. And that's what we're going to talk about in this podcast today. And then the third silo involves preparing tax returns. Now, within each one of these silos, we have professionals that specialize in these services. And as the partner that oversees them, I get to use my experience across all three service areas to help clients understand the full range of accounting tax and financial aspects involved with financing, owning, and operating renewable energy facilities. Great. Thank you for that, Tony. And now let's uh, jump right into our topic for today. In introducing the topic, I mentioned that it's, I think of it in sort of two way, twofold or two aspects of our discussion today. One is uh, the importance of reviewing and thinking about the prior audit and what are some lessons learned from that. The other uh, is to discuss some common mistakes or, you know, items that easily overlook. So let's start with reviewing the prior year audit activity. Share with our audience some of what they should do and some of what you mean when you say review the prior year's activity and the prior year audit. Yeah, great. Thanks. So, yeah, so you, you mentioned earlier too, you said, you know, this is a good podcast for, you know, the accounting teams that work with renewable energy companies. I totally agree. That's why I'm going to, I'm going to forward this podcast to all the audit teams that help us re audit these renewable energy facility financial statements. And I'm going to also forward it to our clients as well, because this really, this podcast really does serve as a bit of a planning tool for all of our renewable energy audit teams and our renewable energy clients to help them sort of gear up to, to sort of close out their financial reporting as strong as possible. And so when I do this, when I get on a call with a client to sort of kick off that planning for their audit, I like to start with the prior year financial statements. The prior year financial statements, they're a really important, helpful tool to sort of help build a bit of an expectation of what the current year might look like. Again, these facilities, once they're placed in service and operating they, and stabilized, the prior year and the current year, they're, they, they're sort of meant to trend consistently. So when you look at the prior year, it helps you frame an expectation of what the current year should look like. Now, also, assuming the entity, the entity was audited last year, go back and review what's called a management letter that you received. A management letter is a letter that your CPA firm issues at the conclusion of the audit. And that letter can highlight certain areas of the audit that were deemed sensitive for one reason or another. I'm thinking of things like significant estimates or maybe significant balances or unique balances that needed to be audited. I recommend taking a look at that letter because it can sort of highlight certain areas that require maybe a little bit more attention. And so Reading the prior year financial statements, the footnotes, and that prior year management letter is a really good starting point to sort of think about how to close out your current year activity. 
Brett, thank you uh, for that. And I suspect that you uh, also think that clients should be reviewing prior to adjusting journal entries. Uh, it seems like that would be a critical step as well, because if you had adjusting journal entries last year, then maybe that's something that was overlooked that you could avoid overlooking by processing them this year. That's great. No, thanks. I appreciate you bringing that up and, and reminding me about that because I, I meant to bring that up as well. So at, again, looking at the prior year, at the conclusion of the audit, the CPA firm provides their clients with any adjusting journal entries or AJEs that were deemed necessary. AJEs, again, they can sometimes, these things can turn into recurring AJEs. However, if you, if you, take, it, if you take some time to review what those prior AJEs were, and consider if that activity applies again this year, gives you an opportunity to record that activity this year before you close your books, which can help prevent that, that item turning into a recurring AJE again. Also, another planning idea involves reviewing what I'll call like interim results. And we may talk about this more in a bit, but for example, you want one thing I recommend is take a look at the first three quarters of the year by running your September 30th general ledger and trial balance. Compare that activity to your budget and investigate variances. Now, what if you don't have a budget? Again, I'm th and this is where I'm kind of thinking back to the prior year. Run your 930 TB or GL and also compare that to your prior activity. And when you kind of look at those 930 balances and compare it to the prior activity or your current year budget, you'll, you're likely to see variances. And those variances can sometimes give give you a clue that something might need to be looked at further and maybe you need to kind of correct some balances before you close books and records for the year. Now you made a good point when you were discussing reviewing the prior year and how we'll be talking about some of these and some, some of these we talk about items often missed or recurring mistakes or is overlooked because in some ways reviewing the prior year audit is all about saying, what did I miss in the prior year? So that I don't miss it this year. So it's a, it's a look into, or something where you say, okay, you know, what might I be overlooking? Uh, what are some common areas when you think of the AJEs, what are some common examples that maybe the audience should be thinking in their mind? Okay. This is something that, uh, I need to look at. Yeah. Good question. So clients are typically great at recording their cash activity. Now, if they're going to overlook something, it tends to be something that doesn't affect cash. So right away, you think depreciation expense or amortization expense. That's just a balance that some clients think, look, it doesn't affect cash. Our auditors are, you know, they know, they know what our useful lives are. They can help us. They can assist us in recording depreciation expense or determining what that amount should be. So we'll leave it up to our auditors. Same thing with things like asset retirement obligations or AROs. Another balances like right of use assets and the corresponding liabilities. And then you've got reserves for credit losses and even HLBV. These are all, these are all balances that don't really affect cash at all, but they are required to be recorded for gap purposes. But a lot of times our clients look at those non-cash balances and think our auditors know our accounting policies. And so we'll, we'll work with them and, and they'll, and they'll sort of help us calculate those amounts pursuant to our accounting policies and just let them propose the entries. But if, if a client records these things more proactively, it means that the books and records that are provided for the audit are already more complete and accurate. There is a strong correlation between the completeness and accuracy of a, of a client's books and records and the timing of when that audit gets completed. So the more complete and accurate you can have that trial balance, increases the chances that that audit's going to get completed quicker and close out the financial reporting process even faster. So I'd encourage clients, if you've seen AJEs before in the past, this gives you an opportunity to sort of look at some of these non-cash items like AROs, depreciation, amortization, ROUs, and liabilities, and book them before year end and reach out to us. Reach out to us and say, look, are there some balances you think, are there, is there some activity that we could we could get a jump start on that could help us maybe avoid some AJEs this year. And we'd be happy to go through those with you and help shed some light on that activity. And I would just also note that as auditors, we're auditing the client's entries and we're not preparing the entries for the clients and we can't audit what we prepared. So there is that important line for clients to be mindful of that, that they 
they record the entries, we audit the entries that they record. Yeah, so let's no to, doubt, but, no, no doubt. Yeah, good, good, discla- good overall disclaimer. Can't stress that <laughs> enough. That's that's all, yeah, absolutely. We are not the client's internal controls by any means, or right. or determining accounting policy. No, that's. I just mean. think it's important that clients understand that we're auditing their entries, and and we're we're not preparing an entry, and that if we're if we're preparing the entry, then we can't audit the entry. So that's the, you know, an important dividing line for you know, clients and there's areas where, you know, it's, it, 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 it is important to keep that as the overarching rule and all, all part of general accepted accounting principles and auditing standards and the like. Enough about that. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. Let's move on to the offense, overlooked, missed, you know, mistakes, you know, those that occur quite often with clients and Obviously, the purpose of this podcast is those listening can keep these from happening and their audits. And, and I would say that the whole, the whole point of the, the podcast is to make the audit run smoother so everyone spends less time on it and clients can get the, the best value uh, for the service. Uh, and one item that I always think about when I think about something that could be overlooked uh, isn't generally with recurring items, because if it's a recurring item, it happened the year before, the year before, and you missed it the first time, since it's recurring, you're probably not missing it every year. Uh, it's the non-recurring items. So, so Tony, if you could talk a bit about non-recurring items and, and some ways in which you see clients commonly overlooking a non-recurring item. Yeah, exactly. So once a facility's placed in service and starts operating, a client's really good about about recording all those kind of normal routine act, financial activity. But during the year, there might be something that takes place that's kind of like out of the norm. It's non-recurring. And either they're confused about how to record it or they record it or they just record it incorrectly. And so what I would say to clients is, you know, that's one of the things that we asked during our planning phase. It's please tell us any non-recurring or unique entries you had to record during the period. We ask that question because they require more, more attention from your auditors. We need to understand your accounting policy around that non-recurring item. We need to understand the nature of the item, get the contractual arrangement around that activity, et cetera. So because it doesn't happen all the time, we don't have the agreements. We need to get the agreement, spend more time there. So examples include things like, when a facility is placed in service, and to be honest with you, when a facility gets placed in service, that's we're really kind of looking closely at how a client capitalized fixed assets, accrued certain EPC payables, recorded interconnection costs. These are all items that I would say are non-recurring and can oftentimes result in adjustment. I want to shine a light for a moment on interconnection costs. Interconnection costs is a really interesting area to audit and account and, and for the accounting for clients. Oftentimes, when a developer is building a facility, the utility where that facility is located will require some kind of deposit with respect to interconnection upgrades that the utility requires in order to receive the power from the facility. Okay, so it's very common that a developer has to make a payment to the utility for what's called an interconnection deposit. Well, that's a deposit. That's an estimated amount that the utility thinks they're going to need for the interconnection, interconnection upgrades. Once the final work is done, there'll be a final accounting of what the actual costs were, and that deposit will get trued up. Usually, when, when the final accounting is determined, it means that the deposit was more than what the developer had paid, and it results in a refund back to our client. Well, if a facility gets placed late in the year, it means that that sort of true up may not get determined until the subsequent year, maybe Q1. And we may discover that somewhere during this subsequent event period. And I think we'll talk a little bit more. I think we'll talk more generally about subsequent events in a bit. But I just want to shine a light a bit on this particular non-recurring item. I want to shine a light on it because it's an, it is an item that we oftentimes find needs an adjusting journal entry. And so I just really want to you know shine a light on it. And so... The client will book the interconnection upgrade deposit. They'll forget or they'll overlook that they're expecting a deposit. And that can result in that interconnection cost being overstated at year end. And so 
take a look at your, if you have facilities that you place in service during Q4, take a moment to consider if you're expecting deposits to come in the, into the subsequent year. And this can give you an opportunity to sort of like course correct on that, on your fixed asset costs and avoid a potential overstatement of fixed assets. So thank you for that. One of the items that I know in right for the podcast we talked about was how, you know, some amounts uh, clients might think of as immaterial from a purely financial perspective, but from the standpoint of properly reporting the condition and the state of the asset or assets, it's super important to record uh, and not take the position that's immaterial. Maybe you could dig a bit deeper into that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so again, I'm going to focus on that first year the facility is placed in service. And Mike, you might think, why are we focusing so much on that first year? That's that's oftentimes where you find the most accounting issues where mistakes may have been made. So I'm going to come back to that year you place the facility in service. Oftentimes, if a client places their facility in service in, say, December, well, what that means is there's probably very little in terms of electricity revenue and operating expenses like O and M, site lease, et cetera. So on some point on some level, the client may think that whatever electricity revenue operates that occurred that month, it's so it's so small that it's not worth the administrative burden to record the activity. And while I think a lot of people can agree that those amounts are likely immaterial quantitatively, the users of the financial statement. So now I'm thinking of your your investors, your cash economic, cash equity investor, maybe your tax equity investor, your lender. They may not, they, from a qualitative standpoint, they may view those those that activity as meaningful. So it may not add up to a lot quantitatively, but they sort of they sort of get to the overall completeness of the financial statements. And so if you're a user, you may get the financial statements, and you go to the you go to the P&L and you're expecting to see at least some operating revenues and expenses. When they're not there, that can trigger a question from your users. And again, the amounts may not add up to much, but qualitatively, they just feel wrong. And so I would discourage clients from trying to take from trying to justify not recording that December activity in year one of operations simply because the amounts are small. It has an even more significant impact on the tax return. Okay. One thing that we've seen with tax reporting is the facility gets placed in service in December. The client doesn't record any operating revenues whatsoever or any operating expenses, but records a significant ITC and a big tax depreciation number with no revenues. I've I've seen that become an area that can catch the interest of an IRS agent where they think, geez, this is interesting. They're reporting tax credits and depreciation, but it doesn't appear as though the facility's in service because there's no operating revenues. And so this comment I'm making about immaterial balances, where it can really have a payoff to record them, it's not just on the financial statements, but it also kind of carries over to your tax reporting as well. No, when you said it, it sort of qualitatively feels wrong. Healthy feels wrong because it is. <laughs> it, exactly. Exactly. Right. And so, the, again, the amounts might be small, but still, it's like if you, you, you know, it's, you, there are certain things you just expect to see. And when they're not there, it just calls into question the overall accuracy and completeness of the of the whole entire set of financial statements. No, absolutely. And speaking about the completeness and accuracy of the financial statements, and one of the other ones we talked about in preparing for the podcast had to do with, you know, some clients thinking audits are really all about the numbers uh, and the footnotes. And that, you know, the audit doesn't necessarily go much beyond you know, the the, the formal financial statements. So maybe you could discuss some of the areas that clients often skip over that you know we have to cover in the course of an audit. That's right. So here I'm thinking about things like changes in your internal control environment, changes in personnel within your accounting and financial department or your IT environment, changes in accounting software. These are things where they may not have any impact on the numbers whatsoever, but they impact the auditor's planning of the audit. You know, when an auditor plans their audit, they they gain a certain understanding of the of the company's internal control, the personnel, 
roles and responsibilities that are involved in the financial reporting process. And obviously they need an understanding of the accounting software as well. So your number, the client's numbers could be perfect and require no adjustments whatsoever. But in terms of just our, our planning of the audit to sort of determine how much testing we need to do and what areas to test, we need to fully understand, well, we need to understand, gain an understanding of a client's internal control environment, the personnel and software, et cetera. So if you had any of these changes during the year, again, I encourage you reach out to your auditors and say, look, we'd like to kick off a planning call. There's been some changes in our personnel or software, what have you. We'd like to make you aware of that so you can gain an understanding as you do your audit planning. Great. Thank you for that. Now, one other item that you hinted at earlier had to do with reporting of accruals. Uh, you noted that, you know, cash usually gets taken care of because you have the, you know, the money flowing through the, the bank accounts and those uh, items getting reported. But accruals, on the other hand, uh, sometimes can be overlooked or missed. Or I think of accruals, I think of accrual uh, of some type of liability, which would be associated generally with the accrual of an expense. But it could also be associated with the accrual of an asset, accruing the liability and then booking an asset. And then similarly, missing accruals of income, which end up understating assets because you don't have the compensating and the corresponding asset account for the income accrual or kind of reducing or adjusting a liability account or a deferred income account. Maybe talk a bit about some of the commonly overlooked sort of year end accruals in some of the ways in which clients themselves can be reviewing events after the end of the year to help them identify those accruals. Sure. So in the year of facilities in place and service, a common accrual that gets missed there might be an EPC payable. So, you know, you, the, the project is, you might have a facility that's in construction or maybe just place and service. Certain contractors and subcontractors sometimes Sometimes it takes them a, a bit of time to sort of submit their invoices. And so you might get a subcontractor that doesn't submit their invoice for the work they performed in December. They may not submit that invoice until, say, February or March. Okay, but that, that amount also might be meaningful and really should be accounted for. The services were rendered in December. The, the invoice just didn't come in in time. And so I for, for that's one that's that's an example of an accrual on sort of the construction and development side of things. On the operating side, you know, things like, you know, tax accrual, property tax accruals are common. Accounting fee accruals can also be, can also be common. Related party payables. Related party payables are, all, are another good one. Like sometimes a client will forget to accrue their asset management fee or something like that. And so what, what a client might do there is some of these amounts that may not be overly significant, they may account for more, they may just get in the habit of accounting for a bit more on a cash basis, if you will. Again, they're not significant by dollar amount. And so they may just find it administratively more convenient to account for more on a cash basis. But we, we as part of our audit, you know, we're looking at the activity that takes place in that subsequent event period. When I'm talking about the subsequent event period, I'm really talking, you know, after the year end has ended, now we're looking at those first weeks, months, whatever, following year end. So for calendar year filers, we're talking, you know, January, if you say February or March. And so I encourage our clients to kind of be mindful of those payments, those cash payments that you're making in January and February in particular, consider when the services were rendered and consider whether or not those services really should have been accrued as of year end. And again, if you catch it, if you as a client discover that before us, it can just it means that our subsequent event audit testing can go quicker, easier, and again, complete the audit more efficiently. Interest, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, interest on, on loans, that's another item, another classic accrual where a client may forget to accrue interest expense uh, for December. And maybe you could share with the uh, audience from an investor's perspective, uh, what sort of deadlines do they generally have for getting a audit? Great. Yep. So in, in the renewable energy industry, the most common financial reporting deadline we see in operating agreements for when financial statement audits are supposed to be finalized is March 31st. That's for the, that's for the project company partnership. Fl call, we'll, we'll, I'll refer to like a partnership flip entity here. So if you get a partnership flip style entity with a tax equity investor, that flip partnership 
the most common financial reporting deadline for those types of entities is usually March 31st. In terms of parent companies, the parent company deadlines can either be March 31st, but more commonly more like an April 30th or sometimes even a May 31st. Drafts, sometimes the partnership agreements will require a draft by the end of February. But you, you notice I'm referring to the, the terms in the operating agreement. If you're unfamiliar with when your financial statements are due, every- Get familiar. <laughs> yeah, get familiar, get, get familiar. Usually it's it's very rare that an operating agreement doesn't actually stipulate when the financial statement audit is due. And oftentimes it'll indicate when the drafts are due and when the finals are due. And so get familiar with those, make sure you're kind of planning your audit issuance around those deadlines, but also be sensitive. A lot of renewable energy companies have upstream um, cash equity investors. And sometimes those cash equity investors might have earlier deadlines that puts additional pressure at the partnership flip entity. So, you know, if you're if you're a controller or CFO with a renewable energy company, don't just look at the, it's also helpful to look at your upstream financial reporting deadlines as well. Thank you for that. I just probably should have led with that because the one of the purposes of all this going more smoothly is so you can meet those deadlines. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to have one of these uh, audits going out at a time and trying to deal with overlooked items, things of that nature. When you start having a multitude of these uh, you know, project finance entities, uh, it's all the more important to avoid, uh, you know, a little bit of the back and forth to more efficiently get through this process and get the reports out to uh, your investors. Because uh, you know, every uh, developer wants the investor to get their financials on time and all the rest. So this is a so it's something that you're building a better relationship with your partner. No doubt. So we've got back. To... I wanted to see yeah. if there were any other financial reporting developments happening that you wanted to draw some attention to as we start to bring the podcast to a close. Sure. Right. So this is really this is really a note for the investors out there. You know, since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, you know, we're seeing a lot of new entrants into the renewable energy space in terms of tax equity investors. And a hot topic with the investor community is around proportion the proportional amortization method of accounting that is an accounting method that investors into tax credit partnerships can consider if, if they qualify for and many i know it's i know a lot of investors that have entered the space within the last 12 to 18 months have focused heavily on the criteria to qualify for pam and have found that they that they can and they're using that and sort of that can be a difference maker for you so if you're an investor or if you're working with a a potential new investor and they're trying to figure out ways to sort of make it easier for them to invest in the program, um, reach out to us. We can help you understand proportional amortization accounting, and, and that can oftentimes be uh, appealing to, to investors in this space. Thank you for that, Tony. And please do stick around for the off mic section of the podcast, where you'll get to share an industry shout out or two. And to our listeners, Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. You can access the podcast at www.novaco.com slash podcast or through Apple Podcasts or through Spotify, uh, as well as through YouTube. And please, if there are other platforms you think we should be on, please let us know. And if you have ideas or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at cpas at novaco.com. Now let's turn to our off mic section, which is a fun segment where we get to acknowledge our industry colleagues with shout outs. So Tony, what's your industry shout out or shout outs this week? Great. Thanks, Mike. So this week, I'd like to give a shout out to the companies focused on providing particularly deep impacts to the deployment of clean energy. There are many doing this, but two companies quickly come to mind. And I'm talking about U.S. Bank's Impact Finance Group and Monarch Private Capital's Strategic Ventures Group, both of which are making a concerted effort to provide clean energy to disadvantaged communities and persons, which historically have lacked access to clean energy due to the perceived added difficulties when it comes to underwriting these types of end users. Great, thank you for that shout out, Tony. Let me echo that shout out to U.S. Bank's Impact Finance Group and Monarch Private Capital's Strategic Ventures Group. Uh, I also greatly appreciate the work that they're doing to bring clean energy to disadvantaged communities and persons. 
And as always, Tony, thank you for joining us uh, on the podcast. Uh, our audience always appreciates you being back. And I look forward to your next visit. Same here. Thanks, Mike. And then to our listeners and viewers, I'm Mike Novogratik. Thanks for listening and for watching. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and Company, LLP. Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Radio Public. You can find related links referenced in this podcast on our website at www.novaco.com slash podcast. Novogratik and Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.